Since 1837, the iconic building Buckingham Palace in London, England has served as the official residence of Britain's sovereigns, the Queen. Buckingham Palace has been the focus of many moments of national celebration, from jubilees to weddings to VE days and the annual Trooping the Colour, which marks the Queen's official birthday. It is also a busy, working building, welcoming tens of thousands of people through its gates each year for investitures, garden parties, audiences and other events. Explore this magnificent building via our virtual tours. The first tour will take you to the Grand Staircase. The throne room today is used for special occasions, such as for royal wedding photographs. The grandest of all the staterooms is a white drawing room for the Queen and members of the royal family before state occasions. Before we continue, leave a like on this video, smash that subscribe button, and hit the notification bell to be the first watching new episodes of our videos. Although it's unlikely to come on the market anytime soon, the palatial residence of Great Britain's Queen Elizabeth II is generally agreed to be the world's most valuable residence, estimated by Money Magazine, among others, to be worth some $2.9 billion. Part of that price tag may be due to the palace's royal providence, in part due to its location in London, a city whose land is among the world's most expensive. But the building isn't too shabby either. Buckingham Palace has 775 rooms, including 52 bedrooms for the royals and their guests, 188 bedrooms for staff, 78 bathrooms, and 92 offices. That's in addition to 19 staterooms, among them a state dining room, a music room, and an obvious necessity for any sitting monarch, a throne room. The ballroom is a more recent addition, built by Queen Victoria in time to celebrate the end of the Crimean War in 1856. The palace's gardens cover some 40 acres. The Queen doesn't actually own the palace, it's held in trust. Not to worry though, Her Majesty is unlikely ever to be homeless. She owns a couple of other royal retreats, including the stately Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Incidentally, the closest thing the United States has to Buckingham Palace is valued by the real estate website Zillow at $410 million. A fair rental price, it says, would be about $1.8 million a month. Then again, it is a lot smaller, with a mere 132 rooms. It is surprising that Buckingham Palace is one of the most expensive homes in the world. What is surprising is the price tag at $2.9 billion. This regal palace is like a miniature town. Construction began on the royal property in 1703, making this a historical landmark, as well as one of the most expensive houses in the world to live in. With five floors and a total of 775 rooms, it's hard to believe the royal family doesn't get lost in there. Within the palace, the Queen's Gallery exhibits work from the Royal Art Collection, including Fabergé eggs and drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. The changing of the guard takes place regularly, generally every morning from May through July and every other morning during the rest of the year. But the royal standard is flown over the palace only when the sovereign is in residence. Traditionally closed to the public, the staterooms of the palace were open to tourists during August and September in the mid-1990s in order to finance repairs to Windsor Castle, which was damaged by fire in 1992. Since the mid-18th century, the Royal Mews, stables and coach houses with living quarters above, have been located on the palace grounds. The current buildings date from 1824 to 1825. Within the Mews are the luxurious motor cars, dozens of carriages, and horses that figure prominently in royal processions and ceremonies. Notable among the carriages are the Gold State Coach, 1762, the Irish State Coach, 1852, and the Glass State Coach, 1910. Leading northeast from the palace and the Queen Victoria Memorial, the straight avenue of the mall divides St. James Park from Green Park, skirts the grounds of St. James Palace, and eventually reaches the Admiralty Arch, a gateway to Charing Cross. To say that Queen Elizabeth's palaces have some grand rooms is a bit of an understatement. They are adorned with the finest silks and fabrics, filled with historical treasures and hung with priceless old master's artwork from the likes of Rembrandt, Rubens, and Van Dyck. Built over decades by a variety of royals, they often feature a fantastical array of interior styles. Buckingham Palace, for example, shows off Victorian, Regency, and Edwardian influences, whereas Sandringham House is the epitome of Jacobian design. Each property is gargantuan. Windsor Castle, the largest occupied castle in the world, has about 1,000 rooms. To tour one of the Queen's homes is to be awestruck by its beauty. 
Buckingham Palace is a place of marvels, with utilitarian service spaces that open surreally into enfilades of suitably majestic rooms designed to both entertain and dazzle. They stretch out over tens of thousands of acres in the United Kingdom, in lands both urban and rural. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, these magnificent rooms at Buckingham Palace Windsor Castle, whose upkeep is overseen by the Royal Collection Trust, are closed to the public. One day they will be open again, but until then, here are some of the most notable royal spaces across the United Kingdom, from bedchambers to ballrooms and throne rooms. 1844 Room Buckingham Palace The 1844 Room is one of the most important rooms in Buckingham Palace. It's where the Queen, the other members of the royal family, receive distinguished visitors, from the Obamas to President Xi Jinping of China. Some of its more dignified design details? 19th century blue and gold silk upholstered furniture by Morellin Seddon, a neoclassical desk by David Rochin, and malachite candelabras. This room is not open to the public, but thanks to the photo op of the Queen and her famous guests, anyone can still get a glimpse inside. Queen Elizabeth often tapes her annual Christmas message from this resplendent room, which is also used to host small soirees. On those occasions, the monarch makes a discreet entrance from a hidden door that's disguised as a mirror and a cabinet. The room holds a gilded piano by S&P Erard, made for Queen Victoria. Hanging above the fireplace is a pristine portrait of Queen Alexandra, wearing a small diamond crown. A pair of royal blue and gold dotted serves porcelain vases sit on bronze plinths. Throne Room The primary architect of Buckingham Palace, John Nash, had a background in theater design. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the throne room which features theatrical red curtains that wouldn't be out of place in London's West End. The pair of thrones are called the Chairs of Estate. The Queen's chair was used at her 1953 coronation. The Duke of Edinburgh's chair was made later. Crimson Drawing Room, Windsor Castle The dominant color of the Crimson Drawing Room is, you guessed it, a radiant shade of red, accented by gold detailing. Most of the room's exquisite furnishings are by Morel and Seddon, their principal suppliers to King George IV. After a fire ravaged Windsor Castle in 1992, this room was completely restored. The Green Drawing Room, Windsor Castle The Green Drawing Room served as the setting for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex glamorous wedding portraits in 2018. Like the Crimson Drawing Room, it includes a furniture collection by Morel and Seddon, as well as serves porcelain plate that once belonged to Louis XVI of France. Grand Reception Room, Windsor Castle this ballroom features six spectacular tapestries that tell the story of Jason and Medea, from the historic Paris manufacturer Goblins. That's not the only French influence. There are a number of bronze statuettes that originated from the country. Mary, Queen of Scots Chamber, Palace of Holyrood House. The famous queen's bedroom can only be reached by a narrow, winding staircase that leads you to the top of the tower. Most need to duck through the remarkably low entryway, including, once upon a time, Mary herself, who is estimated to be six feet tall. The room ceiling is made of engraved oak, and the walls are adorned in a painted frieze. Just off the bedchamber is the supper room, where Mary's husband killed her private secretary. Privy Chamber, Palace of Holyrood House The Privy Chamber is where Queen Elizabeth holds audiences with the Scottish First Minister when she's in town. The room is covered in tapestries including the settee, which shows Achilles presented with armor. Above the fireplace hangs Jacob Duet II's bathing scene by a river. Although not every monarch was a fan, Queen Victoria covered the painting and its nude figures with a mirrored glass. It was Lord Brabourne, the son-in-law of the royal cousin Lord Mountbatten, who suggested using the medium of television to provide the Queen's subjects a sense of her personality. By the 1960s, the times were rapidly changing, and the shy, dutiful Queen and her young family were seen as increasingly irrelevant. A TV special, Barbourn suggested, could also introduce British subjects to 21-year-old Prince Charles, ahead of his investiture as Prince of Wales. At the urging of palace press officer William Heseltine, who was convinced that offering a humanized view of the royal family would strengthen the monarchy, Prince Philip agreed. The Queen cautiously gave her consent, while other family members were decidedly not on board. But the Mountbatten camp won the day and filming began in 1968. Richard Crossan, the chief of the BBC documentary unit was put in charge of shooting the royals at work and play. For months, he shot 43 hours of unscripted materials at Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, on the royal yacht, the royal train, and even at the Queen's beloved Balmoral Castle in Scotland. 
Understandably, the royal family had a difficult time adjusting to the presence of the crew in their personal space. While the documentary was meant to show the human side of the monarchy, its narration carried an official tone. The voiceover, read by English actor and broadcaster Michael Flanders, ruminated on the importance of the crown to the country in florid terms like, monarchy does not lie in the power it gives to the sovereign, but in the power it denies to anyone else. The Finnish documentary claimed to show a year in the life of the royal family. Queen Elizabeth was featured tirelessly working and making small talk with the world leaders like US President Richard Nixon. During his state visit, she asked him, world problems are so complex, aren't they now? To which Nixon replied, I was thinking how really much more complex they are when we last met in 1957. Thanks for watching. Leave the comment down below and let us know what we should feature next. Don't forget to subscribe for new and upcoming episodes.